everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today, we're going to be talking about anxiety with Elka Scholes, who is the author of the book, Anxiety Warrior. So welcome, Elka. Thank you, CJ. Pleasure to be here. So this is something that all of us are suffer- suffering with a great deal right now um, with over the last year um, and perhaps earlier, depending on your political persuasion. Um, so, um, well, you're in Canada, so maybe you're, you're, I don't know if you suffer as much, but. Oh, yeah, we do. No, no okay. worries. We're, um, yeah, it's anyways. <laughs> so not why I don't want to talk about politics. What I want to no. talk about is anxiety and um, how you would define what anxiety is and how it's different than stress. Yeah, and that's a great question because um, sometimes people think they have a preconceived uh, idea of what anxiety is, and I have a few definitions, and it doesn't really matter so much as to the words we use or perhaps even, um, I think it's, um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about how it manifests, and um, so we can call it anxiety, which is like a feeling of worry, Uh, Typically, we've um, noticed that as perhaps as butterflies, but it also can come with agitation and impatience, um, heart palpitations, uh, sweating, all kinds of different things. And generally, it's a a feeling, it's anticipatory. So when we're anxious, it's something that um, we think is going to happen, or or perhaps our body thinks that. and then we're also going to talk about how, how the body uh, reacts to certain things. Um, so then there's also fear and fear is something real. So um, perhaps it's, um, well, for me, I'm living out in the country. So <laughs> it could be a bear chasing me or a skunk. That's real. But if I'm walking down the road and I'm worried or I think about um, maybe that um, something bad is going to happen or, or I'm going to be chased. That's anticipatory. So a little bit mm. of a difference there. Um, chronic worry um, is uh, when the thoughts are, are coming all the time. Uh, and, and none of these things in itself are um, uh, negative. However, when they take over our lives, when they stop us from thriving, when um, you know they get in the way for for doing anything, that's when it could be problematic. And um, you asked about the difference of stress, and I've I've been asked that a lot. And really, I think um, anxiety, fear, chronic worry all create stress, and mm. and the stress and and those things actually have similar symptoms. So mm. um, we can go over some of those if you like. Okay, so there. Are- um, and, and you were going, um, I don't know when the best time to talk about this, but there's the body and the mind and you drew that differentiation. Can you explain that a little bit about what that differentiation means? Yeah, so um, our minds or the brain actually, which is an organ um, can, pardon me, can create anxiety. Also our bodies can. So here's an interesting thing is um, we sweat during the night and uh, one of the first things I, I will do and ask a client is, uh, you know, are, do they wake up with anxiety? Mm. And a lot of that causes from sweating all night. And when we're dehydrated, the mm. brain actually sends signals to the body oh. of anxiety. So uh, a simple thing as having a few sips of water when you wake up, if that is the case, that will definitely lower uh, the intensity of the anxiety. Sometimes it makes it go away. And um, it's interesting, a lot of my clients uh, do do that, they include that, and they're amazed at how much um, less of, a, of that unpleasantness they have. So yeah, so your body is your body imagining during your dream time that, or is your body is just going through like the heat of like having too many covers on and then yeah, just sweating. Anxiety. We, sweat, we sweat through the night and, um, you know, hopefully most of us are sleeping, um, seven to eight hours. 
So that's a lot of time uh, without anything. Um, and yeah, so we're naturally uh, maybe low on water. And if we're, and this can happen during the day, it does happen a lot in the mornings, but um, just know that, you know, sometimes having that uh, few sips of water will definitely rehydrate the body. So the brain, um, it can, that's when, you know, that brain does that physical thing um, uh, with the body. So Hmm. Where I thought you were going with that, and maybe this is also the case, and I don't know if it's the brain or the body that starts this, but, you know, I was talking to my friend and that, um, you know, the COVID has brought up my survival instincts and I'm a- acutely aware of what my body does now, having gone through this period of time, it was actually very illuminating to know what happens. And when I get into a stress, when I get into kind of the worry and the doubt and the fear, I literally like my body has a pattern of just like popping up and out, like I go out of body and I go like floating on the sky. (laughs) Other people go in. When I've worked with clients, they work, go in and they kind of internalize everything. Some people go into fighting, you know, it's a whole fight, flight, flee thing. So could it be that your body has like a certain anxiety pattern that gets built into it? It's possible. And um, so, so we can, everybody, so this is, it's lovely that you said this because each of us and each body is different. And so um, what I like to do is if, if um, perhaps teach or, or help people understand Um, you know, what is it that their body's going through? And you're right, is um, I'm not going to have all the physical symptoms maybe somebody else may have and, um, or perhaps it's cognitive. So uh, we can have things like stiff neck, we could have tension, or um, we can have these heart palpitations or sweating, weight gain, weight loss, um, locked jaw, like all these things Mm. can be physical pardon me, doesn't mean that all of us are going to have all those symptoms. You may just have one, or perhaps um, it's a cognitive thing. So anxiety can create a lack of concentration. It can um, Mm. also um, affect us with memory or this worst um, um, scenario type thinking. Um, So that can happen cognitively. But again, maybe... Uh, not everybody's going to have all of these. And then behaviorally, um, nail biting is, is uh, a mm. result or hair pulling or obsessive compulsive or binge eating or, or crying or, or stuttering. All those things can be behavioral. But again, you might not have any of those. You might have one of them. Um, and then there's the emotional um, part where, you know, uh, we might feel overwhelmed Or like you said, you know, this feeling outside of yourself, Um, perhaps it's feeling of dread or loneliness or unhappiness, confusion, different things like that. So it's kind of a combination and, and, and it doesn't mean, I guess what it does mean is that just understand where you are in your body. And, and one of the things I say, uh, CJ, if out of anything, um, whether it's the book or our talks is awareness is you know, first and foremost, be aware, understand, you know, yourself. And, and like you were mentioning, maybe you have patterns and, um, uh, you know, it could lead us to one of the strategies and, um, you know, understand where you are, where you are Mm. at and understand what your limits are. And then the other word that you'll hear me say it's practice is uh, practice the strategies that, doesn't mean it's ever perfect. Um, Life is practice. So it's about practicing. Mm. Um, Yeah. Mm. Okay. So here's what I I just got. And I think you, we had started off the conversation before the interview that (laughs) it's, you wanted people to be, um, to understand what anxiety um, is. And what I, what I got is like, okay, now I have all these signals. If I'm nail biting, if I'm sweating, if I have butterfly in my stomachs, um, 
if I'm anticipating worst case scenarios all the time, or I have lack of concentration, I have a hard time memorying. Like I didn't realize that they could come in. Like you, you came up with all the different flavors, whether it's cognitive <laughs> and what happens to your brain, your body, what happens to your body, emotionally, if you find yourself crying or overwhelmed. Um, so now there's all these like, aha, I've been anxious a lot, but I didn't know that that was anxiety. I just, I didn't really have a word for it, but um, um, I think given um, my culture, which is the Chinese culture, there's a lot of worry. And I came from two parents who um, were immigrants that fled from communist China. So it's kind of like, it feels almost like it's been genetically embedded in me to constantly yes. worry. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I get well, it. It's possible. Yes. And it, that is one of the, um, um, layers where anxiety can be inherited. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh-huh. Absolutely. All right. So you, there's all these different kinds. There's generalized anxiety order. There's a social phobia, panic disorder, um, disorder, disorder, um, agoraphobia, um, all different types of phobia, phobias, PTSD and OCD. These are all forms of anxiety. Right. So give us, can you give us kind of a highlight of what some of these things are? So um, I think we've already, have we already talked about general anxiety disorder? Well, well, it's um, yes and no. So, um, and one of the things you did ask about the stress and, and having words for it. So just, I don't want to forget about that is, um, so again, if you want to call this stress, it's okay. And, and so our listeners, just so they know, um, and, and can stress be anxiety or can anxiety cause stress? Sure. It doesn't really matter how we word that. And, um, like you said, now we're giving words to some of these things that we've been feeling. And that's again, part of that understanding. So, um, generalized anxiety and, um, and also that's been part of the drive for me, um, has made me, um, do this because I have generalized anxiety and, um, and so what, like we all have anxiety as humans and that's not a bad thing. And just because we learn strategies or perhaps um, manage it doesn't mean it'll ever go away completely. What it does mean though, we can make it smaller. We can certainly make it manageable and um, we can actually um, bring it in like an opportunity or a gift. And um, so anxiety is there to uh, speak to us and to, um, yeah, give us clues, uh, you know, so if I have anxiety and I don't like it any more or less, <laughs> I just go into my, my, myself and then I go through my checklist and just go, okay, what is it that you're trying to tell me? What is it that I'm anxious about? And um usually that comes up and um and and then i have to look after it whatever it is so so generalized anxiety um so what that may be is uh, this continuation of these sensations of you know if you're always restless if you're always irritated mm -hmm. um edgy quite a bit um perhaps it shows up in as fatigue uh, perhaps, um, you know, uh, because it's exhausting. So uh, some people get agitated and, and um, kind of uh, their energy ramps up. Other people go the other way. And I think you indicated that about, you know, going in and, and kind of there's a little bit of a, like a shutdown in a way. Um, it could just be tense. Maybe um, it shows up in your body as backache or tense muscles. Mm. Um or perhaps, you know, I have people coming into my practice saying that um, they're having trouble concentrating or they, they can't seem to read anymore. Um, and so, uh, or, or they just feel very bombarded with negative thinking patterns and um, this kind of disaster thinking, which I think, um, you know, we have to be careful uh, these days so we right. don't go to that place right mm. so there are strategies for all these things and 
The other thing, um, CJ, is... Oh, wait, uh, before we go, can you tell yeah. me the strategy of the checklist? You told me two things that you have on your checklist. Where do you try... So when you are feeling a sense of that you're trying to make smaller and manage your anxiety, you ask, what are you trying to tell me? Where are you anxious about? What's the rest of the checklist? Well, okay. So my um, bedside table is kind of my anxiety warrior station. So the first thing I'll do is I'll drink water. So mm -hmm. have I had enough water? Um, is there something I ate that has created mm. this? And mm. then we, you know, we'll talk about some of that. Um, and, and then it's, what are you trying to tell me? Like what, what's, what's on your plate right now? What's going on? Um, you know, is it, um, was it a dream? I mean, you mentioned that, um, was it something I watched last night or, was it something somebody told me about, or, or do I need to attend to my mortgage or, um, am I worried about, um, a diagnosis, you know, that's coming up or am I concerned that I've got to write a test? Um, so it's just kind of seeing, you know, what, what is it that's on your plate? Are you worried about a loved one? I mean, there's, there's different things. And then like, again, it's a clue. So instead of ignoring it or pushing away this feeling that's so unpleasant is bring it in. And as soon as you do that, it just okay. Occurs. So the one that I would do, I, mine, if it's like nine out of 10, I'm worried about my kids. So let's say I go through and I'm like, oh, I'm worried about my kids. Um, now, is there another strategy or is it like, okay, now I know what this is all about. And that kind of calms everything down. A lot of times it calms it down because um, it's like me listening to you and you listening to me. Like when you, when you feel really heard, mm. what happens to you, right? We Right. You attune to me and that's like, ah, someone gets it. Hey, I'm, I'm anxious in here, CJ you get it? <laughs> oh, what is it? Your kids. <sighs> yeah. A lot right. of times. Yep. And then it's awareness then, that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the other thing we can do, the next step is, is there something I need to do? Mm. So is there something I need to do? So is it something I need to talk to them about? Is there something I need to do? Um, sometimes there isn't sometimes right. it's enough and your body just goes, okay. And it does go. Or other times it's, no, we got to attend to this. Okay. All right. And sometimes we can't. Um, so uh, a lot of times to um, the brain, when we acknowledge those thoughts is if we can't do anything about it, we can let it go. Right. If we, <laughs> right. <laughs> if we well, what are we going to do about it is if we're going to just keep worrying, it's not really doing anybody any good. So there's right. some of those worries that kind of drop off. And, oh, yeah, that, you know, I can't do anything about the weather, let's say, or um, there's no point in it. It's just going to be what it is. Yeah, just let it go. So that's kind of like a whole kind of from beginning to like, all right, I can't do anything about it. Let it go. So, so that's generalized anxiety disorder. Um, there's different flavors of this. There are social yes. phobias. What's that? Well, social phobia is um, uh, specifically a phobia of attending social um, engagements, perhaps. Um, uh, it's a little bit different than uh, agoraphobia. So um, the social phobia is uh, a sense of feeling that you're watched all the time. Perhaps you're thinking that, you know, um, uh, my, you know, my neighbors are thinking about me all the time or they're mm. judging me or, you know, you go to, to uh, town and all oh, those people are judging me. And so having that kind of thoughts of, um, you know, obsessing over being watched mm. is a social phobia. Um, perhaps it's fear of uh, public speaking. Um, you know, not wanting to get up in front of crowds or have anybody look at us. Perhaps uh, we don't want that attention on us. So we'd rather um, not be in a social environment. So some of us may have that a little bit. However, if it stops you from, um, you know, attending social functions or perhaps stops you from, um, you know, going for that interview or, you um, you know, perhaps even attending an office party or, or any kind of gathering, then you may want to look at, maybe I've got to deal with this. Maybe I've got to look mm -hmm. at um, 
you know, how can I get over it? Um, and how are the strategies? Are there, so are there, like you talked about general anxiety disorder, and I could look at the, the your checklist and say, I could use that for anything. Yeah. But are there, for social ones, are there specific strategies that you would suggest for that? Well, um, yes and no. And that's kind of the cool part. Um, so <laughs> that's a big question. So interesting. Um, in my book, the first 29 pages is really talking about anxiety and understanding it. And and a lot of that is layered. So, um, you know, um, maybe maybe there's a little bit of me that has social anxiety. Maybe there's a little bit of me that has this anxiety. You might look at it that way. But mm. here's the other thing. The rest of the book has strategy after strategy. So, um, you know, social anxiety, if, if maybe, you know, you sit down and maybe that, um, so the checklist can be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It could be, wow, you know, look at my negative thinking. Maybe I've got to do this exercise and um, I can give you an exercise for worry and, and negative thinking. Um, mm -hmm. So it's about retraining our brain, re retraining our thinking. Um, perhaps it's about being present. Um, so it's like experimenting with some of these strategies as to how am I going to lower my anxiety. So one of the things I do talk about is the zero to 10 scale. So zero is calm. So doesn't mean you're happy. It just means I'm calm. I'm harmonic right now. Pardon me. So even that, you know, that breathing that we did, it's like, ah, right. That, that calm. So the rest of the world is all this stuff still happening. 10 is I can't put a thought together. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would call it short circuiting. Like I would just feel this, ah, like it just, the words weren't coming together. So that anxiety is so, so high that we're not thinking very well or mm. not thinking at all. So, so one of the things to do is really understand where you are zero to 10 mm. and it's not a test. And everybody's number, our number, you and I might just be a little different. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's just what that number is for you. Mm -hmm. And um, knowing that like right now, I'm, I'm not a zero. However, mm -hmm. I don't expect to be because I want to be present with you. I'm excited. Um, I wouldn't call myself anxious, but certainly um, I'm on. So I would be like, I would call myself maybe a two. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, OK, I'm ready. I'm here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, so then it's understanding your body as to, you know, what's comfortable, what's a comfortable number for you. Mm. Right. And so if this whether it's social anxiety, whether it's some of these phobias, if they're up here at an eight, nine, ten, that's not comfortable anymore. Right. So that's like, have, it's that, yeah, you need to do something at that point. You can't just right. be how at the party. How do we lower that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How do we lower that? And the other, other interesting part about that is, is, um, you know, when I'm at a four, I'm already feeling uncomfortable. So mm. I'm going to start pulling out my strategies. Um, because if I get to a five and a six, it won't take much for me to go to a 10. Mm. Right. So that it, again, it's this understanding of, you know, where's that quick kind of, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it a release, but sort of this kind of ex explosion, I suppose, or, or um, this rise of energy. Um, where is that for you? So it's really like knowing your limits and um, sometimes with these phobias and, and, um, so there's a there's general phobias where people are afraid of chickens or perhaps they're afraid of spiders or mm -hmm. mice. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we can avoid these things. Mm. So if we can avoid them and still thrive, then why worry about it? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it just may be something that um, you know um, you'll avoid spiders or or um, however, however that is. But if it's things that you can't avoid. Yeah, like an office, but like, let's say you have to do a presentation of your work. You've done a bunch of work you're supposed to present. 
you go in there, you're like, even before you present, you're at a four, and then you find yourself as your boss goes, now, where did you get these budget numbers? You find yourself like a nine, you know, like, so at that moment, what are things that you can do to de- de-escalate without going like, hold on a second, let me run my checklist. <laughs> like, <laughs> what are things that you can do? Are there kind you know, yeah, like we talk and, about uh, it that's, breath. That's a great question. And uh, so a lot of these things um, we can anticipate and we can prepare. Mm-hmm. So let's say um, we're going to do that office presentation and we already know we've got a little bit of anxiety. We already know that perhaps maybe we've got some social phobias. Um, so what we want to do is prepare ahead of time. So maybe it's, it's about making a calming tea. Perhaps it's using essential oils. Perhaps it's doing a tapping technique, which uh, I know we're going to spend some time on strategy. So and there's some breathing techniques that we can do to keep ourselves calm. And a, a very cool uh, strategy is the tapping, because once you're in that presentation, <laughs> you can either tap your toes so nobody even has to know. Oh, or so you you're tap- tapping your toes. Um, and I know that I noticed on your website, you're an EMDR person. So are you tapping right, left, right, left, right, yeah. left? Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So you're, I'm actually tapping. I'm like, so basically if I were tapping my toes, I would be like tapping my feet back, right, left, right, left. So there's bilateral stimulation. You know, a lot of tapping is right. like this, like, uh, you know, I've seen therapists do this. Yep. I've yep. seen, you can do um, that. yeah. So, so the tapping on like the most, the least obvious one, cause you can't be like in a meeting, like, hold on a second. Yep, yep, <laughs> that's right, right. Well, tapping you do it ahead feet. of time. You know, there's a lot we do ahead of time. And I had an instructor and a brilliant woman, very organized. So she did a lot of prep work. So everything was organized. She had an assistant and, and everything um, she had herself prepared. She had all our notes prepared. And then the other thing she did, she, before she even started presenting, she just went in a corner and she did some um, centering exercises and some breathing exercises mm. and, um, and she grounded herself. And then she would do that at break times too. And she was very good at boundary setting and saying, you know, at this break, um, I'm just going to take some time. So it was brilliant. And it was also a great modeling as well. And so we can do some of these things, especially if we know we're going into an environment is prepare as much as we possibly can. And um, just so you know, I have all my notes here. I prepare. I know it's lovely. And then, so there's the grounding, which um, I do when I, um, I've time for this often when I actually am coaching people before an interview. And so we'll practice. And I think practice is probably another thing, which is part of the preparing, right? So I'll, ask someone like so why are you interested in this job and I'll see like they're in, I can actually feel their anxiety rising and so I'll say okay ground yourself before the meeting so I imagine like you have roots of a tree going down into the earth from their feet nice. and from their bottom or the deep breath you know just letting go of the tension so those are things that you're talking about which is preparing not only, you know, I think also in those particular cases, you know, there's always someone in the meeting, like, I know they're going to ask me about the budget. They always ask about the budget. Right. So like even preparing your answers beforehand, not only your paperwork and everything I'm hearing that would be, so those are some social and how about things like going to an office party, right? That's also really hard to prepare because we're human beings. You really don't know if someone's like, Hey, CJ, you know, how's the blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, they may come up with something that's going to shock me or maybe they'll touch me in a way that I'm like, you know, like, so how does one prepare for, or I'm going to, um, the worst I remember when I was um, in college people, I'd be going to a frat party, right. Or a, a sorority mixer. And you're like, oh gosh, I have to be on right now. And that's, extremely hard I assume if you have social phobia so what are things you can do or even like I remember so let's cover the party and I want to cover the idea of asking someone out on a date which I had to do as well for my sorority parties but let's do the social thing so you're at a party 
office party, you know, sorority party, it's a mixer, networking party, and you're trying to like get your resume out there or do whatever, um, or, you know, be recruited by the company, the sorority, whatever. Um, what are things that you can do in preparation for that event? Well, uh, and this can be a lot of fun, is role play. So, um, and I do this actually with my clients and we sit down and we just play out some different scenarios. Mm -hmm. And um, so you practice some answers ahead of time. So people that have been off work perhaps and they're going back into the workplace or like you were saying, you know, making certain presentations or perhaps it's going to a party and you know there's gonna be questions and people are curious, they're just naturally curious. So having some answers ready so that uh, you've rehearsed them, so you're ready. And, and that actually really helps a lot from the feedback. Mm -hmm. And I've done it to myself. And then the other thing, which is um, a really a great strategy, and it takes a little practice, and it works quite lovely, is you don't even have to answer the question. Um, so if somebody says something, you know, let's say it's somebody returning back to work. Um, so how are you doing? And uh, so what were you off for? And then you just take a deep breath and just say, you know, I'm just so taken by the weather today. And, and I, I think it's just amazing. And I've got stuff growing in my garden and you deflect. And you uh, deflect. You're just saying like, I don't want to talk about that. I mean, so I'm just listening by to Joni deflecting. Abbott. And a lot of times either people, they do understand and they, they go along with it. Yeah, they're and like, okay, a, I a lot it. of times people don't even notice. So, um, <laughs> or, well, no, they don't because it's, it's, you know, I don't, I don't know why, but, um, but then we can also go into, you know, I can say, well, how are your kids? And, and so what are, what are they up to? And, and, um, and, and then people get involved with that conversation and then it's not on us anymore. And, and so that, that does work. Um, I've had clients and coach them in that and they've come back um, and they just said, wow, that works so amazing. And the other thing that people have done, and this is a great strategy is that they had a buddy system. So they didn't necessarily go to that function with that person. However, um, they had made an agreement ahead of time that that person could just watch over them. So maybe the agreement is um, just make sure I'm not standing by myself. Mm. So if I'm alone, can you make sure that you come over? Mm -hmm. um, so whatever, or um, perhaps it's a certain group. Um, you know, I don't want to get into that conversation and I'm nervous and, you know, um, and so make sure I'm not alone with, with that group. And it doesn't mean it's always negative. It's not about that or avoiding. It's just having sort of a buddy system ahead of time. And what's really cool with that strategy is um, sometimes it's just knowing that that person is watching over you and, yeah, sweet. and, and then we relax and we know we're not alone. And we also know that they've got our backs if we mm. need them. And mm. um, that's certainly, so those are a few things that can definitely um, lower that. Um, that social anxiety. anxiety. So one of the things that I've often heard um, with people who um, are introverts is that, you know, people ask the, I don't, I don't know what kind of questions that you typically rehearse for, but when I'm parties, like, how are you doing? What are you up for? How are your kids? That's kind of like my circle of friends. I don't really know um, for younger kids. It's like, I, I don't know what they're, what they talk about, but are there kind of specific questions that you rehearse for um, and what do you do when you just are kind of like, I hate when people make small talk. Um, how do you, how do you prepare for the small talk, even though you actually hate the small talk? <laughs> hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, maybe it's about um, initiating conversations and that you like, and I don't know what mm. is small talk like that could be uh different things for different people right mm -hmm. so i mean we live i live in the country so the weather is actually really important and mm. it dictates so much of what we do because we're either working outside or we're doing sports and 
So it is a topic of discussion. Um, and I don't know, I, I, um, that's interesting. Um, I tend to be very quiet myself at parties and I'm just happy being a listener. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I haven't seen it as problematic, but um, that's interesting. I guess I just end up listening if I don't like the small talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the other question is now it comes like we're getting to like more concentric circles of the heat map. So now you're about to go on a date, you know, which you, you're, you're asking someone on a date and you're about to go on a date and you have social phobia. What would you, how would you pursue that? Well, I think again, it's back to that prep work and you know, what's um, a lot of fun because I do help people with that. And um, so it's having uh, questions ahead of time mm. and, and I want to call them, uh, if I dare say interesting questions, maybe questions we don't normally think about or ask is, um, you know, what's your ch favorite childhood memory or um, if you remember something from your childhood or if you'd want to do something over again, what would you do or where did you vacation? Um, so a lot of these childhood or family questions, um, and maybe that isn't always a, a, a good thing for people, depending on, you know, their family, but maybe it's about early work experiences um, or, or education experiences. So again, it's about preparing some of these questions. And you know what the other thing is, um, is also really breathing and listening and uh, knowing that the other person they're wanting to get to know you and perhaps they want to tell stories and it's just listening listening to them and being a good listener and and um so kind of so maybe instead of worrying so much about you know how we present ourselves or or how nervous we are is maybe focusing on the other person and just going wow, look at their, you know, they're uh, playing with their pen a lot, or they're fiddling, right. they're fiddling with their scarf or their hair, or, you know, noticing that they're maybe mm. nervous too, and, um, or excited, or however they interpret that, mm. and, and just breathing, and, and sometimes those quiet silences, I, I don't know, I mean, different cultures are different, and, and sometimes we think that, um, a silence pause is awkward and it doesn't have to be it can be quite beautiful it could just be a place to breathe to just center yourself again and you know the other person can do that and it also gives the opening for them to uh, ask a question or be mm -hmm. inviting so I hope that's helpful yeah it is it's super helpful I think that the 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 issues that um, come up for me are Oh, if I pause, you know, it's kind of like, I'm supposed to, you know, this nowadays in work settings, I get this a lot with the clients that I coach. It's all about collaboration. Mm. And you may just want to listen. You may not want to collaborate during those social, because you have social phobia. So it's like the whole idea of putting yourself out there and giving your idea and pushing for your idea is not what you do. You kind of listen, you hear different ideas and those kinds of things. So how does one um, feel okay with not being the person who's talking, you know, because in a lot of social situations, there's kind of a fear like, oh, I'm that quiet gal on the side corner, not saying anything. Um, you know, now I feel a little bit bad. What are people thinking about me? I need to actually say something. I need to collaborate in this meeting because I know that in my review, if I don't collaborate, I'm going to get dinged for doing this. Um, what are some ways to, I guess, put yourself out there or be okay with not putting yourself out there? Yeah, and I think a lot of that is about um, what I was getting from that is about just being and being okay with who you are. And, mm. and, um, and you know, it, it's interesting because in, in these questions, we are dealing with some of these sources of you know, what's our, what's my belief system? Am I good enough? Am I good enough just to be, am I good enough? Um, mm. You know, and, and, and this is really interesting too, is how can I trust myself 
that I will know the answer? How will I trust myself that I'll know what to say in that next situation? Mm. And um, if we can um, relax in that, and, and sometimes it does mean to consciously pause and to breathe and to uh, come back to that present moment of, you know, perhaps it isn't about uh, collaborating at that particular moment. Perhaps it's about listening. And um, I've used this technique too, is, you know, when I'm listening and then I think, well, I, have, I don't know what to contribute, then I don't. I just mm. keep listening. And then there's this aha moment of, okay, I've just heard all this, this collective wisdom, which we have, right? And just go, oh, what, what about what you just said? That sounded really fascinating. Or can we expand on that? And, um, and, and here's the thing is we need the audience just as much as we need the performers. And, <laughs> Well, it is. It's true. It's and, so um, true. Right. And and sometimes um, whether it's a jam session, whether it's theater, the audience is just so much part of the performance. And just like you and I, you know, our audience, we wouldn't have this if we didn't have our audience. So we can be listeners and really be OK with being the audience. And mm -hmm. um and, and here's an interesting thing is when we get this confidence that um, does permeate and people will feel that. Like if I feel that and I'm very comfortable listening, mm. then I'm putting out that energy of comfort and relaxation, not of awkwardness or you know, um, mm. like you can tell, you can tell when somebody feels awkward and they're not knowing what to say, but you can also tell when somebody's very relaxed and they're very comfortable in listening. Mm. So just be yourself, right? So if you're the quiet person, Absolutely. and I also hear the other thing that you're saying is, you know, and this is what I've instructed clients too, is that when you're in a collaboration, <laughs> most times when you're at work, no one's listening to each other. They just want to get their points in. So they're like, it's just like, it's not even a ping pong match. You're all taking their ping pong ball and throwing it in the air. And it makes no sense. It's like tangentially related. And so even going like, I'm not sure where we're going with this conversation. Cause we started here. We went here, we went there because no one is listening to listen, <laughs> just be the observer and say, I'm a little bit confused with where we Absolutely. are. Absolutely. And, um, Yes, and CJ, you're so correct. Um, I noticed that how much um, we interrupt each other, not you and I so much because we're tuning into each other. It just does happen. And, and I noticed that in groups, I noticed that and, and even in social settings. And, and, and it's kind of lovely to step back and let people just keep interrupting each other. <laughs> Um, and noticing it's it, and yeah and I think you know I love what you said just be yourself um, uh, be with them a moment and if you're still a little nervous but it's okay it's and it's okay to say that if you know somebody kind of centers you out just all right now I'm not sure we could, and um, you know but let me keep listening and I'll, I'll think of something yeah, I like that. I like to let me stop listening. I don't have anything to contribute right now, but let me keep on listening because that is your role in a collaboration. Some, I love the whole idea of like in a performance, which someone who's like going out there, bleh, 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 you know, they're performing. <laughs> someone has to watch it all. <laughs> so just being a listener and watching it all is right. in, in effect how you're collaborating. I just, that's, that is so perfect. I love that. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, we have been talking to um, Elka Schultz um, about her book, The Anxiety Warrior. We're going to come back and talk about a little bit more of these, um, of these um, um, different ways that people experience anxiety. We were just talking about social phobia. There are a whole bunch of other things that we haven't had a chance to talk to. So we will be right back. Thank you so Sounds much. Great. 